All right, we're starting up with the November chair committee tech call. Got a few folks on so far and waiting for a few others to join. Let's see, let's see if anyone else joins the next minute and then we'll get going. A link to the agenda is there if you don't have it yet. And I was just adding a bunch of things last minute to the agenda. And I may just go ahead and share my screen here. Okay. Anyone else joining? Yes. Okay, ticked over one minute. So let's go get going. Is there anyone we can have to take notes on the call? I think Harsh did it last time. So maybe someone other than Harsh. <clears throat> I can do it. Uh... Great, thank you. And I think it's set for anyone to just have a suggestion, right? So just go ahead and type in and I'll confirm everything at the end. Um, let's see, and then also please go ahead and add yourself to the list of the attendees if you haven't yet. Okay, and I think we have some newcomers here this call. At least uh, the Center for Open Science folks, not new to share, but getting, you're, you're still relatively new to this call, right? Yeah, that's, uh, that's true. I've kind of lurked on uh, one or two before, but I guess, so intro myself, is that, I don't know. I'm Abram Booth, uh, was uh, sort of on the share team when we kind of built share v2 here at CUS and uh, I'm still, and, and now the maintainer of, uh, of kind of the share instance that we have um, going. So I'm familiar with a lot of the issues that share faces and such, but uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to see where it goes from here. Great, great. And for the recording also, I'm, I'm Rick Johnson from Notre Dame here. Uh, so let's go ahead and keep rolling on through. Any other newcomers? Okay. Uh, so looking at the action items from the last call, scrolling down. Uh, so I think, Cam, you had the first two. Is Cam on today? Maybe he was not. I'm going to send him a note to see where he's at. Okay. Let's see. And Harsh, I know you did take a look at GitHub. We've got something on the list to show for that. Uh, let's see, I have started pushing my updated flow code to GitHub as well, so we'll show that. Um, of course, have the agenda created, and then the issue was created for that, yeah, for the open door stuff. So, any questions on any of this? Uh, I would like to uh, demo one of my flows I've worked on. Great, great. Perfect, perfect. All right. So I think the only thing we had before that was to mention that we were selected to present at CNI on December 10th. So myself and Ryan Mason and Cam Blanford were all going to present. Uh, I think it's at 5.45 p.m. I think is the presentation time. So the last time slot of the first day there. Um, so are there the basic, we have kind of a rough skeleton in place for the presentation, still working through it, but the plan is to go through a lot of the, the strategy around the community effort of uh, community development, building up more shared governance, 
working towards community shared infrastructure kind of things of that nature and then and then the plan to demo a little bit of the early technology at the end there and it's it's a 30 minute presentation so it's so we'll probably be moving through all of that pretty quickly because we'll want to have five or ten minutes for questions at least at the end all right let's see if there's any thing on that uh, you know, hand it, stop sharing, hand it over to Harsh if you're able to, are you able to demo the pushing point from GitHub? Yeah, sure thing. Desktop. Let me see if I can share my screen. Okay. See my screen now? Yes, perfect. perfect. Um, so I was looking at uh, how do we ingest uh, these flows over here uh, in the shared red flows directory into uh, into the shared red. Um, so typically, uh, when you just say start with node, let me get the font higher. When you just say node red, it's it loads a specific settings file. Um, which is this one. Um, and right now it doesn't have projects enabled. So it says projects disabled and there's a specific setting which you can go and change and say, if I make this true uh, in the settings file, you're enabling settings, right? Um, and then if you start node red again, it's going to say, settings file, the same settings file, and now it knows that you, you've enabled projects, but there are no active projects. Uh, so when you go to the UI, the first thing it's gonna do is say, okay, which project do you wanna use? Because you've enabled it. Um, and then you can either create a project or you can clone a project, or clone a repository. So in this case, we wanna clone a repository and it's going to ask you to set up your version control and in this case, it's my username and email in GitHub. And then you give it a project name. So let's just call it, um, let's just call it SRF or actually I already have one of those. I'm gonna call it SRF one and give it a, the Git repository URL and username password to your GitHub profile and give it an encryption key. It could be anything, uh, but you want to store it somewhere uh, where you can access it again later. So let's just say something. And when you clone the project, it's going to get it over here. So now you now this file has been loaded from a GitHub repository and you can tell that by clicking this button over here and you can look at the commit history. So these are all the commits that were made to that repository earlier. Um, there's a couple of changes you can, couple of ways you can work on this flow uh, to push and pull from the repository itself. Um, so you can say add something um, and let's say we connect it here and then I can hit deploy. So it's gonna say you have a local change and you can add that as a commit and then push it uh, to the repository. Uh, I haven't really figured out how to do branching from the UI yet. Um, so, so alternatively, what, what I've been thinking about is instead of, um, instead of using the UI, um, when you when you actually create the when you clone the project, it's going to create a create a projects folder. It already has a projects folder, but it's going to add that project over here. So um, in this case, okay, I see what's happening. So I don't see the projects folder over here right now, and that's specifically the reason I'm using a different settings file. So um, I want to go back uh, backtrack a little bit. Um, so initially, when I showed you how to uh, start uh, how to change the settings file. Um, instead of using the default settings file, which is in the Node-RED folder, um, 
it would be easier, uh, a little bit more convenient and more explicit to use, uh, use the settings file in the share red repository. So which is share red slash settings.js, right? Um, and you can indicate to indicate to share red, node red, that you want to use that file by saying use user dir dot, which is the path to your settings file, which in this case is the current folder. So if I do that, um, it's going to pick up the settings file, uh, which I have in my local folder, um, which is right here. And now if I ingest, so it already has one project because I was playing with this earlier, but let me try to repeat the same thing again. Uh, so if I, if I go to, um, so this is not going to work now. If I go back to my console um, and and this is an unrelated issue, so I need not worry about that right now. Um, but I can say uh, projects and I can say new project and I can clone the repository and do the same process uh, again. And what's gonna happen is it's going to create this folder over here under projects folder. Um, and then that's the clone repository right there. Um, so now I have a way to say, uh, go to projects um, to, the, to the one that I just cloned and that is version control. So I can say, uh, and there is no, I can do all the git commands over here now. Um, and that project folder is a subfolder within your share red repository. And this is just local file. So when you commit this file, it's not going to go to the share red project. It's going to go to the share red flows project because it's it's got a separate Git configuration over here. Um, uh, it, does anybody have any questions? Great. Uh, so what I will do is actually uh, just do like a simple quick write up on this uh, in GitHub issues. Um, and I know Rick closed it today morning, but uh, if it helps just for uh, folks to like reference later and even for myself from a learning standpoint that yes, this this is the way I figured this out and you know, maybe we need to change it later again uh, just to add some history on that. Uh, so I'll create, uh, I'll add some notes in the GitHub issue uh, related to this uh, work and we can reference that later. I'll add it to the meeting notes after this meeting. Hi Harsh, this is, this is really, uh, I good stuff. I, I, I didn't know that Node-RED had this capability uh, built in. Um, so it's exciting to, to see it. Um, from a security standpoint, because we're not encrypting, I, I don't think we have, you know, I don't think the server sets up SSL certs or uh, well, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's doing that. Um, is it then passing that get your GitHub password locally unencrypted? Do we need to maybe make it easy to create a SSL cert for the local server? Um, I, I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, and, and, and I think what it's, uh, so, so your question, I didn't really understand it very clearly. Uh, so your question is about uh, when the flow file is sitting on the local machine, is it encrypted or unencrypted? Is that your question? Well, that one is encrypted, I know, and that's what you're doing with the credentials. Uh, yeah. Um, I guess, and I, maybe maybe it's not even that big of a risk because it's, you're, you know, well, I guess it would be, I don't know. Uh, you have to submit your password there. You, 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 I'm guessing post the password to that backend yeah. server and yeah. that is unencrypted. And so I, I suppose if someone then, you know, had some way to monitor your local machine, they'd be able to yeah. grab that potentially. Oh, I see what uh, you're saying. Yeah. So maybe we need to make it easy to create a cert, install it to the local server so that nothing, no credentials then, you know, go over over unencrypted channels. I, I don't know. Maybe it, it's fairly, it's a fairly low risk uh, issue, uh, but I think it's, it could be an issue nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Something to think about. Um, and you're referring that specifically to the GitHub credentials, correct? In, in that case that I saw, yeah, that was the only, 
at the credential that you passed across. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I see what you're saying because it does maintain that connection from Node-RED to GitHub once you've given it those credentials. So, well, in that part, I expect to be somewhere. encrypted via, you know, GitHub's uh, 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 cert. Yeah. Um, it's just this, the, the one where you, from the interface, hit the back end of your own server. And again, mm -hmm. it's probably fairly low risk, but just something we should think about. Sure. Um, I can I can post a question to someone in like on the Slack channel for Node-RED and see what other people are doing about it okay. and if it's a concern at all. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thanks, Rich. Thank you. Great. Great demo, though. Sure thing. Yeah. Thank you, Harsh. And 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 then, and you probably saw on that first screen uh, that Harsh had where there were a couple unknown nodes and that's actually something i discovered <laughs> just before the call here that i was working through trying to fix there's a there's a couple package dependencies that are not in the main uh, package.json file yet in the uh, the share red repo in github and i had some merge conflicts when i was trying to push it up so i so i ran out of time essentially but i'm going to work on that after the call here to clean that up Okay, thanks, Rick. Uh, that saves me the energy to like figure out what's going on. <laughs> sure, sure. But yeah, but I, I can I can actually uh, show you what it looks like with that stuff turned on. If there isn't anything else on the GitHub one before we move to other demos, let's see here. Let me share again, and then I think Abhinav, you said you had a demo as well. We can go to you after me probably. Let's see, okay. So hopefully you can see my screen again. Yes. All right, so the two nodes that were missing were these splitter ones and the weight paths. And those are two NPM modules that uh, it has to load. And I think, I think if you reference it in the package.json, it will go ahead and bring those in when you bring the repo, when you do like an NPM start, is that right? I'm trying to remember all the steps that you have to do to like to have it reference the dependencies. But anyhow, I'll, I'll yeah, get those NPM up there. Install, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. So, so essentially um, the work I did since last time, uh, so, so kind of recap about what is happening here. So this is making a call to Crossref uh, it is first taking in a config file that is, can do I remove this? This is blocking me, thank you. Wait, oh, there we go. I think I had the config file open here. Yes. Yeah, so it's taking in this config file where it sets the URL of where it needs to uh, send the rest calls to Crossref and then a mapping of what is the crossref expected attribute to find, creator, given name, family name, title, et cetera. Uh, so essentially that is then being loaded into the environment memory here. It's currently setting it in the global config and that's something I wanna move to the, just the general flow config because Obviously that global will not work unless we're running just this one. But essentially then it takes, uh, it takes the URL from the global config there, sends the request. Here it is actually uh, taking the array of items and splitting that into separate items. So then it actually does all of these flows once for each of the items in this array coming from here. That's what uh, this splitter one is doing and then the thing that but the thing that I added this time uh, was joining the different parsing operations for each one so it's actually gonna say oh, I want to get my creators I'm gonna get my titles and when it does that it has them returned in separate objects and then what this weight paths one is doing is it's actually merging those into one object and then it's pushing it through so let me and this again, let me clear out the output here. I also got rid of a bunch of errors that were happening with the code in there, some type errors. 
So, so what's happening here is looking at one example. So the, the payload here, it's, it's got my creators and it's got my titles and it is, and for the moment I was pushing the, the input work all together just into this object here in the same one. Ideally this is pulled out and in a separate place and I kind of came halfway where I have this separately there, but I didn't quite get it pulled out of the flow right to get it out of this section yet. But essentially the idea is that it's taking all of the metadata from here and then it's gonna start mapping it to new objects and properties into here. And what is done so far is creators and titles. And before it, it was actually coming back as separate uh, objects and so now it's all in one. So that was an important step there. So now really all that is necessary now to add other properties is you just have to add to this list of flows new, new items to grab the properties push it to an object and then you set up a similar thing where you say, I want to get the titles, creators, etc." cetera. Uh, and then this wait paths object takes those in and what it will do is pretty cool. Is it will actually wait for all of these things to finish before it moves on to the next step. This was a, a node module that I, that I found. Um, so that, that's one of the great things about using Node Red is there's lots of modules like this that already exist. And these timeouts are configurable to set it up however you want. Uh, if you don't want things to, to wait on those to, to move on, I think the, this, the step would be to not have it be within this wait paths block, but that's definitely possible. And then right here, I'm just grabbing the work here. I am grabbing the paths and then just pushing it to the payload object, the main, the main output object, because by default it's down here. So I just thought I'll, I would just go ahead and push it to there for now. Any questions on this stuff? I was very interested in the weight logic. Um, so, so the one that you have, the blue node, that, yeah. that one is, you want to set the timeout to the slowest one preceding them. So if, if we know like, you know, maybe the first yellow block is going to take the most time, you want to set at least that weight path at least to the timeout for higher than the time, higher than that, the timeout to be higher yep. than that. Yep. Uh, but I wonder like, can you set weights on those individual yellow nodes too? like wait for a certain time before sending it or and I haven't played much with this so I, that's something for me to explore too but yeah you, I, I would assume you could the that I before where I, when I was looking for the how to do this there were lots of different ways people were doing it uh, where they wrote more code themselves like there's a way to do it with um, with a join node as well I saw that looked more intensive in terms of setting it up. So I thought I would try this first, but yeah, I, I would assume that all that's on that. And I haven't looked at the code behind this wait paths node either. That's all, you know, that's all wrapped up somehow within the, the packaging for the node itself. Yeah, yep. This is great. Yeah, but, I would, but now when I was, this is a good segue where I think this flow in particular, for example, is ready for someone to collaborate on. So if their environment is set up right and they take it, they could actually add other properties to this while other people are working and working in parallel because they could work on new code to parse for other properties. So like all of this, this is all self-contained, right? So that could be worked on independent of, of me continuing to work on this. So I think this is in a, in a, in a good place to start to branch off a little bit. And I, and I started creating some issues in GitHub to list some of the different tasks for that. Like, for example, changing this to push it to, there's a flow context instead of a global context that I think is probably where it belongs. So like just this particular flow is where those properties would live. Um, things like that. 
Yeah, I would love to do one of those issues um, and work through it, Rick. Great, great. Yeah, and and I was actually just pushing all of these up with the GitHub. There, there, there's a there's a few quirks to it where you make a change, like say if I I can just add something real quick. It now will detect that I made a change here, and I can t I can look at it, look at the change that happens, and this is actually really nice. The way it does it, it will show me exactly everything that's new here, and then all you have to do is you know push this down, do the commit, and then it will do the commit message and show, and then the other additional step that you have to do that isn't necessarily obvious. Uh, sorry, my Zoom window is continually in the way. There we go. There, this little button here will show a one next to the up arrow. And then you just have to push that up. And, and myself, I have the luxury of being a committer on the repo, but not everyone has that case, so I can just push it up to it. But in, 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 in other cases, you'll likely need to fork from the main repo and then push up to that, and then, then once you've pushed your changes up, you can submit uh, pull requests, things like that. So Rick, uh, just a quick thing I noticed, like I, when you added a new node yeah. uh, right now, uh, you didn't have to do like a deploy for the changes to show up in in local changes, did you? Oh yeah, I I didn't see that. So if you just take that node out, yep. the one that you added, and try to add it back again, um, so, and then you refresh that on the local changes. And do I well, let's see if I deploy it? And when I deployed, that went away. That change went away, I guess. Yeah, and now let, let try try adding a node again. Okay. Because. Okay, so so. Yeah, it's not showing. I don't know what this file is, by the way. But <laughs> I didn't look into that yet. Didn't you hit the refresh button, Rick, when you added the node last time? Did I? If you did. There's, yeah, the, re the refresh button right next to where it says local changes. Oh, this one. Yeah. Yeah, because I had to actually like hit like a, you know, deploy changes and then it showed up as a, hey, I found like there's a change on your local flow file, so. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure what happened before, but that's what seems to have been necessary just now. Because it didn't show up until I just clicked deploy. Yeah. Now, now it's here. But yeah, deploy again, that'll go away. But yeah, but essentially, so, it's that, so the other tricky thing that was obvious from when Harsh was demoing and I'm demoing is like there's the two nodes that are missing in his and they're on mine and we have those, those settings split. Those settings are in the other repo, the share red repo and, and this harvest flows is in its own repo. So, so that's one of the things that we'll probably need to work through is how to best keep those in sync, or if we, or it's, or if we should change that repo hierarchy, etc., um, something just to think about. Yeah, if there's no questions on this, I'll hand it over. Abhinav, you said you had wanted a demo as well. Yeah. Great. Okay. Where is the shit? Oh, it's here. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. So <clears throat> I was uh, kind of working like a for a prototype of how the 
entire pipeline for harvesting will look like, like uh, getting it from a say source. So I'm using PubMed Central for this and uh, I'm using OIP image endpoint of theirs. So, and also <laughs> the entire flow is like, you get it from a list of records from OIP image, parse it, and then you can put it in MongoDB or you can uh, also put it in Elasticsearch. And you also have some things like if there's an error in parsing, you put that in Elasticsearch, the entire document so that you can parse it again later on and see all those errors. And uh, then you can use MongoDB as like a source of truth for all the data that you pass. So this was kind of what I was trying. And then uh, we also thinking of building like a feed kind of thing on Elasticsearch so that you can put your queries and then uh, check how a uh, feed flow will look like. Suppose someone wants to uh, get the records for a particular institution. So he can uh, say that uh, I want records for Virginia Tech. So once that record gets entered, he'll be uh, uh, notified about that. So that was kind of the flow I was working on. Uh, so I was able to achieve uh, putting it into database. I'm here to work on the feed part. So there are a couple of uh, good uh, uh, things and some pain points I realized while working in this. So one of them is, uh, so this OAI PMH endpoints, they work on the basis of some something called resumption token. Like uh, if the number of records are too high, they won't give you all the records, they'll give you in batches. And then in batches of 2025, and then uh, you'll give you a resumption token, which you can use again to query the next batch of uh, articles. So if you want to, uh, continue your parsing for say a long period of time and harvest everything. Uh, in that case, you will need to set up some way of uh, taking the resumption token and changing your URL again and again. So that was one part. And then uh, the error parsing was one new thing I discovered, like you can have the catch nodes and then you can specify uh, what all the nodes from which you want to catch the errors. Uh, like in this case, I'm uh, catching all the parsing errors and then putting it into Elasticsearch. Then there's a DB error, which is the error which happens when I'm inserting. That goes into there. And all these errors will uh, also, this ingestion will also uh, ingest all the uh, raw data so that you can parse it again, uh, whatever error was there. And then regain that uh, data, it won't be lost. And uh, so this is uh, the node which puts the parse data into ES and uh, and this is the node which uh, puts it into MongoDB. Uh, and then there is a node uh, for MongoDB where I'm storing the state of harvesting, like what was the last time range in which I harvested. So this I'll read initially to uh, start my start and end time of my harvesting and then update it later on saying that I harvested for this time. And then next time if you start, you read it again and uh, do that. And then this is the resumption token file, uh, which gets updated every batch so that I can create a URL uh, appropriately. So this URL, if you see, it either has a resumption token URL or uh, this URL, which is uh, the URL, which is created for like, uh, PubMed has a from and to URL. So if you see, so, if you want to list records from this time range, you can use this. So that's what I'm using here. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so yeah, so this is, uh, this switch is either first checking in database. Uh, so if it's first uh, getting the resumption token, initially the resumption token will be empty, so there would be anything. So it will go to database and get the time ranges and create a URL. And then this is where I'm doing the mapping part. So yeah, one more thing I realized that all these uh, big uh, repositories, uh, the schema for their data keeps on changing. Like if you uh, parse their uh, OAI PMH res results for say 2004 versus 2018, you'll see the schema file has changed. So because the schema file keeps on changing, this mapping will also depend on the schema which that uh, particular repository is using. So for this purposes, uh, for the purpose of this uh, demo, uh, I think there's, uh, this is the schema file, which uh, I'm, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. 
And and the schema file that you need, does that change depending on which set of records you Yeah. You so query? Every, every record you get, you also get the schema location like this. Uh, okay. So you can use this to determine if your flow will work for this particular record or not. So I noticed that I, I'm, I'm, I, my flow works for this kind of schema, but there's one more schema which keeps on coming in between. It's something, some other name and uh, my flow fails for that. So for that, uh, all the records go into ES error uh, index. Mm. So I can, I, I, I don't lose the data. Uh, that's why I had to uh, work on this error part, but still uh, you will need to make multiple mappings for the same source also. That's what I realized. Like, that's one of the challenges I guess. So I can uh, demo this part like. Um, and one other question I had the these, I see that is there, are those persistent connections with the, the get last date and the PMC DB? Uh, sorry. So, so it's, 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 it's showing as connected without mm -hmm. you running anything essentially. Yeah. So those, those so my are database connected. is running locally. So it's connected. That's, that's what's showing that I'm, I can connect to the database, which you have specified. Okay. Yeah. So like if I uh, shut down my database, it will show that it's not connected. So then you, then mm -hmm. no point running your flow. That's, I mean, that's And then uh, regarding the passing thing, which you mentioned, so I had to like create different functions for each field because either, so it could be done two ways. Either you read the entire schema file and come up with a function, which can work for all the combination of the schema or you get the data and figure out what kind of uh, parser you want to write. So in case of an XML data, it is easier to automate because you will know what kind of uh, schema can come. Uh, it's predefined and it's standard standardized. So, so like, uh, I'm fetching quite a lot of things, uh, like article ID. I'll show one of the examples. So these are like the parsing nodes. So all these are individual functions which parse one particular record, one particular attribute of the record. So right now, if you see uh, my harvesting state, uh, which is stored in MongoDB. So it says uh, the start time, the last start time, the last end time and the uh, end time. So we, we are only concerned about these two right now. So this tells me that last time I started here and ended here. So when I run the flow, I'll start from this date and I'll do it for one year. So my start date will be this and end date will be 2007, one month. That, so, that may be a window that we can't see. The... Oh, oh so, uh, wait. It's possible when you did the sharing, it was just oh. the, the browser. No, no, no worries, just wanted, just wanted to warn you. <laughs> uh -huh. Can you see? Oh now? yes, you can see it now. So yeah, so this is the uh, harvesting state which is stored in MongoDB. So I'm saying uh, this stores the last start and last end date of the harvest. Uh, so when I start my flow again, it will start from this end and do it for one year. So it will fetch records from 2006 to 2007. And uh, right now, if you see, there are no records in the metadata. So uh, if I start here, Can you uh, see the browser? No, now it's just the oh. the command line. Now, can you see it now? Not yet. Oh. There we go. Okay, so I ran the <clears throat> uh, thing, and this is these are the records which come. So this raw field has the entire uh, data in JSON format. Uh, in JSON string format so that if there's some, uh, so because I'm not parsing everything, but I might require that data again. So I don't want to reharvest. So I'm storing the raw data here, which I can parse later on. But uh, there are some fields which I might, which I think will be required. So I'm parsing that. So like the identifier, the schema location, the article type, journal type, publisher name. Now the article IDs in PubMed are pretty uh, comprehensive. Like they give all types of article IDs. So this is what article ID area looks like. Then there's article title. In terms of authors, I have the entire, uh, uh, they also have a type attribute in author, like was he a contributor or author for second, I think. Then they have this. And then there's also a very nice uh, linking between authors and the affiliations. 
So each author has an affiliation ID, which is linked to one of the affiliations. So that way you can determine if this author belongs to Virginia Tech, Notre Dame, or uh, that kind of mapping you can do. So I'm storing the ID here. And if you see affiliations, uh, so affiliation one points to this uh, Arizona State University and then affiliation two. So this is mm -hmm. a good thing. Nice. And then I have, a, I have also uh, extracted the abstract into one particular one and big paragraph. So, which is helpful. And then we also have keywords. So we are thinking of a topic modeling kind of application will uh, might uh, need all these things. And then if someone needs a full text, he can go and parse the raw uh, data and he, he will be able to fetch the full text. So this is what it looks like. And uh, if you see the screen now, we'll have 25 records. Uh, and if you see the resumption text, so it has one resumption token. So if I go and uh, do my flow again, this resumption token will be used. So yeah, so I can, so I, I've actually tried this harvesting like a, in, in terms of a repeat interval. So I can do it every uh, five seconds. And uh, so, and I can run it through the night and it will harvest all the records. So if I do it right now, Yeah, yeah so, so this is harvesting every five seconds. So if, uh, if you see the, um, where is my, yeah, see the terminal. And so with it reharvesting, are you, are you uh, kind of, blowing away the data and, and recreating every time or, or, or is there, they're checking for like existing records? Uh, so because, uh, the, so I'm, I'm assuming uh, the uh, OAI PMH interface of PubMed will handle that part because okay. they are only giving me all the batches, but we can easily uh, mm -hmm. put an index on say identifier and then it will update those records. So if I, so we can check that. So suppose we want to, so metadata count is 192, uh, so it might have changed. Now, if we see how many. But, um, so it's essentially assuming that from the last harvest, you still have those records and it's giving you just new ones. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry, come in. Uh, I can also show the uh, the ES endpoint, uh, which currently so uh, it will create two indexes: one error index and one the actual index. So So if you go here in the dashboard, yeah. So these are the records which are there in Elasticsearch. So the abstract. So we can create a search query on these. Like, suppose I want to search for this affiliation. So so I'll only get that affiliation. Actually, yeah. So all these things. So so we can uh, essentially uh, run the parser for this now. Uh, and that's uh, so, a sorry feed parser which will keep on ingesting. So, this was the uh, demo. That's great. Yeah. And then, like, so, so if we did want to, um, no, I mean, this is really, really fantastic. The, 
So if we, so if we did want to reset the, like on the, the OAI PMH endpoint side saying, mm -hmm. hey, we actually need all records now. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know how, how we yeah. would do that? So, so they don't give, so you have endpoints for fetching all the records, but they don't give you one all at once. They'll give you in batches of 25. So that's mm -hmm. why you need that resumption token. They have this thing, like if the okay. records are more than 25, they'll only give you that 25 and then give you a token, which you can query again to get the next 25. Oh, what's that resumption token? Got it, got it, got it. Okay. So that's why you need to run this like in an interval of some kind. Sure, 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 sure. Mm -hmm. I may be asking questions that other folks already knew the answer to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I really like the, the error handling piece. I didn't know you could do that. Um, and, and just having it in a separate workflow to catch the same error on different nodes. So that's pretty neat. Yeah, yeah that's really nice. Um, I had a quick question about uh, how, how did you go around like uh, ma making those connections to Elasticsearch and uh, MongoDB database? Did are those like inbuilt uh, connection nodes? In uh, so node red? so it's, it's a HTTP request node. So Elasticsearch gives you a HTTP endpoint. So suppose if you want to put some data, this is this this is the index name and this yeah. is the endpoint. So whatever comes in message dot payload gets ingested. Yeah. So you just need to make sure oh, whatever you are passing here is the actual thing which you want to ingest. That's it. Cool. It's just a HTTP endpoint. Sounds like no questions from anyone else. Is that right? Uh, so Rick, uh, the issues that you've created on uh, yeah. share uh, GitHub profile, uh, GitHub, uh, repository. Uh, is it like uh, I can just go pick one which makes the most sense and start working through it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that, that sounds good. Let me share my screen again and I can show that show those for everyone. Yeah, so the so I think before saying that real quick, I would say I mean, I think yours is a great example of one we would want to push up to the share red flows when when you're ready for that so definitely please take a look at that sure. um and at this point it doesn't have to be totally functional it can be it can be error prone and buggy um mm -hmm. we just want to start getting things pushed up mm -hmm. uh but yeah so like pulling up the tickets i had it open here didn't i yeah so so here's the list of issues. so i just I, I'm not sure this is necessarily the long-term best way to do it, but I went ahead and created a bucket milestone called cross ref, ref flow in here just to start to sort some of these. We could certainly do it with labels as well. Um, but I created these ones as kind of ones that were immediate on my list to look at the flow I was working on. Um, so I need to fix this one first. The package.json is not up to date. Uh, Ignore that second one for a second. There was, I talked about the push params to flow context and flowable, add mapping to new fields. This is one that could probably be broken out into like, you know, we could break it into a bunch of different fields looking at what's coming back from Crossref. Um, and then this one, one of the things we were assuming here uh, is that as the objects are coming back and we're building the JSON objects to kind of ensure that it is actually conforming to the share schema. We're assuming we're gonna have a, a validation step of that against share. So that's the idea there is that, I, I said that correctly, right, Ryan Cam? Yeah, you did. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so, so I would say, Harsh, I would say any of these, I'll do the top one. <laughs> the, the package.json, but like the bottom, especially the bottom two, though either of those are definitely fair game. And, and like I said, the, you could even, if you wanted to tag the specific fields you're gonna look at, you could create new issues for that. Sure. So, uh, I've also used an external NPM module in my project. Should I demo how I did that? Because there was one like a caveat kind of thing there. 
Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, so which one were you? Uh, I was using XML parser uh, module. So okay. I'm, so. Um, yeah, do you want me to, I can stop sharing quickly here. So. Yeah, so uh, because everything was in my uh, uh, Yeah, so if you go in the node red uh, file, uh, you can see there's a settings.js. So here uh, there's uh, something called uh, function global context. So you specify that, uh, so you can't just do require something inside a node flow. Uh, flow node so you'll have to uh, import it as a global context so i'm doing this here and the way to install is you have to go to uh, so this is my root directory and then you have to go to uh, uh, yeah you have to go and run npm install here so inside the uh, uh, home uh, like this node red directory you, if you do it outside like in your shared uh, folder it doesn't mm -hmm. Uh, pick it, pick it up because it has to be there in this uh, node modules folder for it to work. Uh, so if you see, so inside the node red under node modules. So if you go to node red and then do npm install whatever, and then put that in your settings.js, uh, you can then uh, go and. So I wonder if that has to do with the, the like the settings change that Harsh mentioned earlier. If, yeah, if you did that, that maybe it would look so at the, the other one as well. Yeah. So this is this is where you get the parser from global context, which you define in your settings.js. Mm -hmm. And now you can use this module. So that's how I did. Cool. Uh, that's it. Okay, and we actually just have five minutes left. We have been rolling right through in the scheduled time here. Um, let me get back to the agenda quickly. So one thing I wanted to mention, um, I was wondering that there may still be some folks that are want to ramp up and I thought maybe we should just start having some drop in hours where myself or Ryan or Cam are available to help folks get their environment set up. Um, so I wanted to pose that. I didn't know what day or time are best for that. Um, I think we had done like a Tuesday morning in the past. And I don't know if that is, is, is that, Ryan or Cam, do you think that is a, a good day or time? Uh, yeah, that works for me. Okay, well, I guess I well, could just pose a question if there's anyone on the call at the moment that, that would want to join that or, or we could continue to kind of leave that as an open option. Yeah, we can definitely host office hours. Okay. Well, we can either, well, why don't we just nail down a time and we can post that to the share dev list in Discord and then if folks want to drop in, they can. And then the last question I had was whether, so, so we have, um, we're going to present at CNI on 
December 10th. The next call is this of this one isn't actually scheduled until December 13th. Um, so just a question of whether it would make sense to meet before then. I am certainly happy and willing to to have another one of these before then. Okay, is that that might help us nail down what we might what might be best to demo, et cetera. Um, any opinions? I'll be calling uh, December 13th, uh, the vacation. But if you want to continue, uh, just go ahead without me. Okay, okay. Okay, well, it sounds like that's uh, just fine. So, like, so I, I, I would assume it is just fine for, I'll be enough to continue yeah. as, as you are working and we'll keep iterating on the various items and and Cam and, and Ryan, your which which items can you re recap like in a minute, kind of the, the things that you're working on too? Uh sure, yeah. So I've been working on a uh a prototype for decentralized browser storage. So you can uh basically contribute to this network by just having your browser open for a little bit. Um and you know that could be extended to like a Chrome extension or something. So whenever you're just on your computer, it's running uh, with zero setup. Um, but that's what I've been working on. Okay. Okay. I've been helping uh, came along with that also as well as well as also working on some of the node red stuff that we've been mentioning. Okay. So then real quick. Okay. So so action items that all makes sense. And probably adding myself uh, update package JSON dependencies is one I need to do. Make sure that happens. Anything else to add to the action item list here, real quick? Okay, sounds like no. All right. Well, if there isn't anything else, thank you for joining. And I'm really excited about the progress so far. This has really been a really exciting call from my end. Um, and I think it'll be good to see where we are if we don't touch base before the 13th to then look at that and then continue to move forward. Yeah, this is good stuff. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Talk to you guys later.